Wi-Fi is bad. Okay. Hi, everybody. I think we're like a minute short, but whatever. Close enough. So, whoa. Welcome to uh, Django Admin Basics and Beyond. It's not the most creative title, but it's what I could come up with while submitting a form to PyCon. Uh, and I can't get Google to switch my slides. There we go. Hi. So I'm Kenneth Love. Um, I teach at Treehouse, which is why I have a lot of Treehouse branding on today. Uh, we're an online school, so if you want to learn stuff, you can come learn from us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can find me as Kenneth Love on Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatever, or GitHub, whatever. So I'm going to be your teacher for the next three hours or so. So first of all, let's talk about what's been done, what you should have installed and ready to go, assuming you followed the instructions I sent you. Uh, if you didn't, that's cool. Assuming Wi-Fi cooperates, we can get everybody set up. So if you don't have that set up, you can raise your hand, and my wonderful TA, Lacey, will hopefully come help. She'll help as much as she can. Um, right now, there is a GitHub. There it is. There's a GitHub repo, which is at Kenneth Love slash PyCon 2017. You can download that. Um, and then it's just like a pip install of some requirements, and you'll be good to go. We'll talk a little bit about what's in here before we start anything, so there'll be a little bit of time to get things set up. All right. So what we have right now is there's two applications that have been created. Uh, there's one called Customers, which has three models, a uh, customer, a purchase, and a purchase item, so a thing that the customer bought. Uh, and then we have Products, which has the product, uh, images that are related to the product, and what category that product is in. So it's a t-shirt, or it's a book, or you know whatever. So two apps, they're pretty small. They don't do anything. Uh, there is a very minimal front end. It's like bootstrap kind of stuff. That doesn't matter, because we're not going to use the bootstrap, or the, the front end. We don't care about the front end. The front end's just there for, you've got a thing to look at if you really want to. Uh, you can't buy anything through it. It's not set up as a store. Nothing like that. OK, so except for those of you who are just now installing it, you should be able to, let me close this. And where's my manage thing? Run server. And you should end up with an app that looks something like this, and an admin That doesn't look like that on me. Let me check out my old stuff. Version control. Um, check out that one. That looks like that. So very empty, very basic admin. Okay. So if you've done like the Django Pulse tutorial or the Django Girls tutorial, you've probably seen an admin similar to this. It may have an app or two in it, but this is the absolute minimum basic admin. Right? This is what Django gives you out of the box. We're going to make it do a lot more than this by the time we get done. OK, everybody in an OK state at this point? Anybody need help getting stuff installed? OK, before we get into this, uh, I've been instructed that I should tell you to go do a survey when your, the class is over. Uh, so I have a link up here that you can look at for the URL, or if you check uh, the guidebook mobile app, there's a link in there to the survey. PyCon just likes to know how well the survey or the tutorials do. So please fill that out when we're done. OK, so let's start at the absolute basic first steps. Okay, We have a Django project running. We have a couple of apps. We have some models. We need to get the thing actually into admin, right? So the easiest way to do that is to register it. So let's look at registering. I have a button over here that shows me a diff. I don't remember which one it is. All right, so in one of the apps, or both of the apps, there's a file called admin.py. Admin.py is where we're going to do almost all of our work today. So I'll show you this diff, and then we'll go actually write the code. 
So if you open up admin.py, right now it's going to look like this, where there's just two lines in it, which uh, imports the admin and gives you a comment. What we want to do is we want to add these lines. So this is actually the customer's admin.py. So let's go ahead and do that together. So we're here in the customer's admin.py. We'll do from this app, import models. And then we can do admin.site.register. Typing in front of people. There we go. Models.customer. So something like that just registers the model with the admin. Okay. Do I need to make this font a little larger for anybody? A little bigger? Okay. It's so hard to know what's going to be a good font size and what's, what's not. How's that? Is that good? Everybody can read that well? All right, cool. I do 18 for live streams. I would have thought that would be good enough for this, but you can never tell with uh, projectors. Yeah, sorry. This is in uh, customers admin.py. We'll want to do the same thing in the products admin, but both of these we just want to do like a registration, right? So we can do this with, uh, let's see, what is it? It's purchase and purchase item. So we have three models. We're going to register three models. And if we do that while our server is running and we refresh our admin, then now we get to see our three items, right? our three different models. So this is the absolute easiest way of getting our models into the admin. And what's cool is this gives us like basically everything that we want. If I want to add a new customer, I can click on add, I can fill out the form, and now the customer you know, exists in the database. I certainly can. Oh, and I will say, if you have the repo checked out, if you check out the branch class, you can hop from tag to tag to tag in Git, and you'll get, get the code. You don't actually have to type it yourself. So this is at tag zero, zero, 001. Two zeros and a one. I made it so you didn't even have to type if you don't want to. You can just watch. And just do Git checkouts constantly. It's more fun that way, but... So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and check out this one just so that I have it. Uh, just force the checkout. I don't care. OK. So at the end of this step, the two admins look basically, al the two admin files, sorry, look basically alike, right? One has customer purchase and purchase item registered. The other one has product image and category registered. So this one's for products. This one's for customers. All right, so registering it like this is cool, but you can't do anything from this point, right? All you've done is say, hey, Django, look at this model. Let me add things, delete things, edit things for it. So what we need, though, now is we need to do a model admin. So a model admin is what lets us customize how the model appears in the admin. It's not the most creative name, but it's a very obvious name. So if you want, you can check out tag 002, or you can see what I did. So we're going to add a really just the absolute basic one. So this is in, again, customers admin.py. We're going to create a class called customer admin, which extends admin.modeladmin. And we're going to pass. We don't have to declare anything inside of it. So you can just put in a comment if you want, like a doc string. You can put in pass, whatever. But then we have to change the registration. Let me see if I can do, yeah, unified. That'll be easier. There we go. So we take out where we had the admin.site.register models.customer, and we replace that with one where we register the customer admin as well. So we register this admin class with the model that we want it to relate to. Right now, 
if you go and refresh the admin, it will look exactly the same as it did before. Because this doesn't do anything special. Right now, it's still the absolute blank that uh, Django gives. There's actually a, another way to do the same registration that's a little bit nicer, requires a little bit less um, typing. Maybe it doesn't, actually. Anyway. Uh, let me let me check that one out and show that one to you. So instead, we can do this. So we still make our admin just like we did before. Our class purchase admin is is just like our cl uh, customer admin, but instead of doing this two-step registration, we register it with an uh, a decorator at the top. This is a little bit cleaner. It's a little bit you know, less typey. But it generates the same work. All right, so we'll pause for a minute, make sure everybody gets their models registered. The only models that you need registered right now are customer and purchase. I mean, let me double check that. Yep. Uh, that's where we're going to do most of our customization, is in those two. And most of the customization from this point on is tiny little things that give us big benefits. At the top, you should have from Django.contrib import admin. So it's a, it's a decorator that just exists inside that admin module. Okay. Yeah, I. I honestly didn't know about this one until I started preparing this tutorial, because <laughs> I've always done it the old way, the, the two-step, right? The, this method. Um, and that still works, and it works great. But the decorator is a really nice way of doing it, just to save yourself a little bit of typing, a little bit of, I got to remember to do this thing and then do this thing, and you know, if I don't have to do that, I don't want to. All right, so on just registering things. Any questions on creating model admins, registering stuff? I can show code again, whatever, whatever everybody needs to see. Let's see, let's, let's put that down. You don't need to see that right now. Okay, let me know when everybody's to this point and then we'll start making things look special. And if you have questions, let me know. I can come and look at stuff, or I can answer any questions you might have, hopefully. All right, does everybody have their models? Still waiting a second, okay. Any, any questions at this point about like what the admin does, what model admin lets us do, what models are? Any, anybody brand new to Django in this? Couple people, okay. So the admin, just in case you haven't played with it before, is a, it's one of those features that you used to be able to show people that did like Ruby or PHP and it would just, you know, make them drop their jaw, because look, I can write five lines and I have 
this thing where I can go and edit all my database tables and it looks nice and I don't have to do any crazy work. Um, it's not as fancy anymore. <laughs> People aren't as impressed. But uh, it gives us a way to add records, edit existing records, or delete existing records from our models without having to write all of that ourselves. Uh, it's not a complete CMS. It's not a thing you're going to want to use as the only manner of getting data in and out of your application uh, forever and ever. But it's a really great place to start. And for smaller projects, it's often all you need. If you're running you know, Amazon, you should probably go build a custom thing. But if you're just like doing a restaurant website, this is plenty for listing you know, meals. And once again, I will say, if you have the Git repo checked out, you can check out the branch class, and then you can check out the tags that I tell you as we go through this, and you'll have all the code automatically. You don't have to type anything at all if you don't want to. All right, so let's see about the next step, which I just realized I switched my slide without being on the slide, so you didn't get to see it. Uh, so let's talk about the list view. The list view is what lets us control how it looks and behaves when we're looking at multiple items at once, so a list of items. All right, Just like uh, in Django's class-based views, we have list view, admins where list view got started. So the first thing let's talk about is displayed fields. So we can change the fields that are displayed on our records. So let's go look at a record real quick. Let me refresh this to make sure we got stuff in there. We do. What have we been working on? We've been working on customers. All right, let's go look at a customer. So if I go in here and I look at customers, right now all I get is their name. And this actually isn't even their name. This is what I listed as the Dunder str Dunder method on the customer class. So I told it to print out whatever they put in as a first name, whatever they put in as a last name, or I think it's just one field name, and then in parentheses whatever they put in as an email address. Okay, so. More or less, this represents what you'd want to see in a customer, right? If you're going to talk about Victoria, you want her first and last name and her email address, and you're good. But I probably want to show more than that if I'm trying to find customers to look up their orders, right? Or to refund their money or whatever. So let's do that. Uh, All right, so we can add an attribute to our, uh, oh, we're doing this to purchases. Okay. I forgot which one I did this to, sorry. Let's go look at a purchase real quick. Okay, so purchases now show three fields, right? I'll go back to what the, how we changed that in a second. Now we have the customer name, we have when the order was placed, whether or not it's shipped, and the total for that order. The way we do that is we override this list display attribute on the admin, and we specify the fields that we want to show. So I said to show the customer, show the placed at, show the shipped, and show the total. So those are all fields on the purchase model. And the nice thing is you can rearrange these. They don't have to show up in the order they're declared on the model or anything like that. You can move these around however you want. You can go further on this too, and you can specify like, uh, an attribute, or not, sorry, not an attribute, a property on the model or a property on the admin. You can do things through relations, through the double underscore connector thing. I wish I had a better name for that. Like I could do customer double underscore name and have just the customer's name instead of the string version. So I'll let everybody get that in there. And then we'll move on to the next bit. So we can also, uh, we're going to go through a, a ton of these different attributes that let us do things. But um, right now, the uh, fields are all displayed, or sorry, not fields, the records are all displayed in the order they were entered into the database, right? So 
We don't have the ID up, but we can see the ID down there at the bottom right now. It's very hard to read. I'm sorry about that. But these are, uh, this is the newest one placed because this was 206, so this was the last one that was created. This is like 205, 204, and so on. So that ordering may not be the ordering that we want. So let's change the ordering. Okay. Now we could obviously change the ordering in the model. Let me pull up the customer's models real quick. And I don't know if you've seen these or not, but you can do like class meta, ordering equals, and then a list of fields to change the ordering. But that's going to change it everywhere that it pulls out of the database. Okay? I may want things sorted in a different order in my admin than I want them sorted on the site or in you know, RSS feeds or something like that. So I don't want to do this in the model. I want to do this just for the admin. So let's pull that one out. And same idea, only now we don't have to do it in class meta. We provide an ordering attribute, and we specify the fields we want it to be ordered by. So this way, we'll get the ones that were in the order that they were placed, uh, as far as dates are concerned, rather than the order the records were created in the database. You might be thinking this is silly. This is somewhat silly. This is because we used a random generator for all of our records in the database. Um, so the ordering may change. On your own, where you're obviously filling them in as the orders come in, that won't be the case. But you'll want to sort it by some other field, right? Maybe it's always by people's names. Maybe it's by whether or not the thing has been shipped. Maybe it's how much they spent. You want the orders where they spent $5,000 up on top and the orders where they spent $20 on the bottom, or vice versa. And one thing that I'm not going to go into in this uh, lecture, but that is good to know, is that all of these attributes that we're going to be overriding, list display, ordering, all the ones that are going to come up, can also be overridden as methods on the class, uh, the, the model admin class. Usually they have a git in front of them, I think. I think it's git display fields. And you can use that if you need to programmatically decide like what things are going to be displayed. Right? I have to check and see if you're level A or level B employee, and if you're level A employee, you get to see how much they spent, and if you're level B employee, you don't, or whatever. All right, everybody good with ordering? Got the idea down for that one? So our next thing is properties. So you might need to control how something appears in the admin list, right? So like right now, if I remember correctly, we're going to do this on customers. We have this thing where we always show the customer name like this, right? But perhaps I want to change how that admin name is done. So I can do that by overwriting a property. So in this customer admin here, I have a list display of admin name. Let me see if I put that onto the, yeah. So I put that onto the customer model. So we're going we're gonna to hop around for a second on this one. So in your models file, sorry, customers models.py, in your customer class, let's go ahead and add this property. And actually, I just realized I did this one wrong. Oh, I have to type it too. There we go. If you're not using Python 3.6, I actually don't think that first line will work. But then neither will that last line with the F string. So Python 3.6 is awesome. Y'all should be sure and upgrade. 3.6 has a lot of cool features. Uh, so Self.name.split potentially splits into more than two items, right? I could have three names, five names, whatever. 
So the star is a collector. So since last is a single individual variable, it will get whatever the last thing is out of the split, and first will get everything else. It's a, a very nice feature of Python 3.6. <laughs> you can put those anywhere you want in, this, in the list, too. So for instance, if you only cared about the first and the last, you could do first, comma, star, comma, last. And the middle bits would just be gone to the ether. But this isn't a Python 3.6 tutorial, so. All right, so let me know when you've all got the property ready in your model, and then we'll go use it in the admin. And this is, again, something that you, you might consider putting this into the admin, in the, in the model admin, as opposed to putting this into your model. But, you know, design decisions are often fuzzy. I kind of feel like this belongs more on the model than on the admin, but I'll leave that up to all of you. All right, so then in admin.py, we want to use this. So in our list display, we're going to use admin name instead of uh, customer, or name, sorry, because we're on the customer model. So name would have been the, uh, the field we were displaying. But now we're going to display admin name instead. And in fact, if you wanted to, you could even do, just to compare them, you could do like admin name and name, and then they'll both show up. Hey, Lacey, do you have a break listed? Going with those two, okay, we're good. I can hear it now. With those two fields. Uh, so if you have those and you go look at your customers, then you should now have a column that says admin name. You probably want to rename that um, with a, what is it? It's like admin name dot short description, I think. Um, but it's fine. It can say admin name. It doesn't really care. Uh, and then name. So normally we would get just Victoria Miller. And now we get Miller Victoria FYU Hotmail. Sorry? Cool. All right. So we can use model properties, and we can use admin properties to change how the admin stuff looks, which is very handy. Obviously, you, you, you rarely want just a raw field all the time. Right? You usually end up having other things that you'd like to have. So let's see what our next thing is. So our next one is for admin methods. So let's check out this code, and then we'll talk about what it's going to be. I'll uh, just force it. Um, the next one should be seven. I have a feeling I have a slide in here that I didn't actually write something for. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that slide then. Let's talk about editable fields. <laughs> okay, so um, big 
big caveat at the beginning of this. If you want to introduce race conditions into your database, this is a great way to do it. You probably don't want race conditions in your database, just so you know. But occasionally, if you're the only person working on something or it's a very small team, you know, you're going to be talking to each other, you're right next to each other, this is fine. And it's a great way to like, quickly get data manipulated. I want to see what happens when this person is active. I want to see what happens when this person's banned, that kind of thing. So it's called editable fields. And you can mark fields as being editable while they're in the list. The reason this introduces a race condition is because I can be looking at the list and I can change something, and you can be looking at the list and you can change something. We both hit save, and we don't know that the other person changed something. So the database gets one of them, and we don't know which one, right? So with that caveat, let's look at how to do it. Because <laughs> that's the most fun way. And the way that you do it is by adding an attribute called list editable. Most of the time, these are very obviously named. I'm glad this is one of those. So what we're going to do in this one is we're going to mark list editable uh, as being the field shipped. And then we've added a couple of fields to our list display on the purchase admin. We're going to add in the shipped at and the shipped field so we can see where these things are. right? So we can see whether or not it's marked as shipped. And we obviously have to have shipped in that list in order for shipped to be editable, because you can't edit a thing you're not looking at. It's very, very hard to click a button on a field that you can't see the field. So I'll give you all a minute to get that in, and then we'll go see what it looks like. Yeah, I, why do I have that field or that slide? You ever have that happen? You get a slide, you don't know where it came from? So any, any questions, any concerns up to this point with our three or four things we've changed so far? Anything feel like magic just yet? I don't want there to be any magic. There's no magic in Django. We had a whole magic removal branch like six, seven years ago. <coughs> All the magic's in the pony now. All right, so let's see what list editable looks like. Uh, and that was on purchases, because purchases are what get shipped, not customers. So now we can see we have a shipped at column, which is going to be empty for a lot of these because of how the random data gets generated. But we also have a shipped column. And notice how these are now check marks and not, uh, or sorry, check boxes and not a check mark graphic. So Crystal Schmidt's order got shipped, and so did Heather Bates's order. So if I scroll to the bottom and I hit save, now they're marked as shipped. Thankfully, none of y'all are editing my database at the same time, because you could have marked those as shipped or somebody else's marked as shipped, and then they get saved differently. Uh, this is most useful on Booleans, like this kind of thing. Uh, it's also really handy on things where you have, like, say, a drop-down list, right? So like a, a state manager or something like that where you want to cause a, a change between like an enum situation, it's one of these five things, this is handy. Um, it's not a thing you want to do all the time, though. Yeah? So yeah, yeah. So your, your question is whether or not each field has its own default form field, effectively? Yeah, it would be the same as like when you um, when you make a, a, a model form, it, it's, it's the exact same idea. It's just putting them into rows. Uh, if you've ever heard of, in, in Django, uh, like an inline form set, these are inline form sets. But these are ones that Django made, so these are not a gigantic pain to deal with, as opposed to when you make them yourself. Um, but yeah, we can do, like, if we want to, uh, let's see, what's another thing we'd want to edit on here? Probably not the customer's name. Let's set it the total. So list editable and total. All right. I should be able to edit this now. Yeah. So I could now edit the total, and I could change how much that order had cost. Um, again, not a great idea, but I can totally do it. Um, most of them are going to show up as text inputs. Uh, this one's obviously uh, restricted to being a number input because you get the little spinner wheel over on the side. But 
they're going to be appropriate for whatever the data type is. Um, the only ones that might not be possible are ones like, say, customer, where it's a foreign key. I don't know if you can do list editable on foreign keys. I would assume you can, but I don't know for certain. Somebody can try it right now if they want to. All right, so where's my slides? OK, so, so far we've looked at how to change what things look like, how they're displayed, uh, and we've made a couple of things editable in our list, which, you know, good or bad. But let's talk about filtering. So I only want to be able to look at some records. I don't want to see, maybe I have 10,000 records. I don't want to see all 10,000. I want to see the 50 that match whatever my thing is that I'm working on. So that's not the thing I slide. That's the thing I slide. And check that out. All right, so now we're going to add one new uh, attribute here. That is not what I wanted. There we go which is the list filter attribute, and we're going to set this equal to a list with the string shipped in it. Now, these are all done as lists. You can do them as tuples if you want. Um, the only thing they have to be is it's, it's a bunch of names, right? So the thing is you can filter by more than one thing. You can filter by five things or two things or whatever. Yes? The tag that I'm currently on is 8, zero, zero, 008. Uh, this thing here, uh, it's just 008. So it's get, it should just be git checkout 008 if you're in the class branch. C-L-A-S-S. -S. Yeah? So um, customer can be editable if you use Right. OK, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, because you'd have to mark something else as being the link that it goes some. I ah, gotcha. All right. So I don't, I don't think I actually bring up list display links on this one. I'll talk about it real quick, though. If you, yeah, it's not a great thing to do. Uh, so if you, when you're changing the fields that are displayed in your list, if you make the, the first field is always linked by default to the record, to the detail view, which we'll get to in a moment. If you make it something that is not easily clicked, so it's something that's editable, or it's um, like a Boolean check mark kind of thing. Often you want to make another item in that list be what's clicked to go look at the detail view. So you can use list display links, and you can mark the field that you want to be clickable, or fields. You can have five of them if you want. Um, but usually you only need that if you start messing around with what's being displayed in what way. So long as your first one is text-based and it's displayed as text, you're good to go. And uh, Django's happy to link that. So when we get this list filter in, that's the purchase, OK. It gives us a really nice little thing over on the sidebar. We now get this filter bar. And this says by shipped. That tells us what field we're filtering by. We're filtering by the shipped field. And we can choose all of the ones that are shipped, or all, all of the ones, period, sorry. We can choose only the ones that are shipped or only the ones that are not shipped. So since this is a Boolean, we have two states, on or off, and then we have an all, of course. So this is a very nice thing to have for setting up all sorts of little ways just to filter your data down so it's something nicer to look at. So everybody got filter going? All right, with filter? All right, let's look at another bit of filtering, which is a little bit more complicated. Not really. Uh, filter by date. So if we have a field that holds onto a date, a time, or a date time, we can then filter by the value that's in that field. Uh, and this is nice because you might be thinking, OK, it's going to show me the ones that are at midnight or noon, right? Django's actually pretty smart and does it by like this week, next week, you know, this month, whatever. So let's check that one out, which this should be 009. And so we're going to add two new fields to this. Uh, we already had shipped. We're going to add placed at and shipped at. Those are our two date times. I bet you can guess what this looks like once it's you know up and running. Uh, 
And the nice thing is you can do this filter with almost any kind of field. Um, I think, again, foreign keys and many to minis get a little weird on filtering, but you can do filtering by like quantities and things like that as well. Some of those you may have to write a custom filter for, but we'll get to that in just a second. The, the filtering in Django Admin is really good. So once you have those fields in, if you refresh your admin, then now you've got two new ones. And these are, of course, cumulative. So if I say I only want things that have been shipped, and only if they've been shipped this month, then I get those two items. So those have been shipped this month. I don't get to see anything that hasn't been shipped, and I don't get to see anything that was shipped before this month. And I think they, they took this out of Django, but it used to be possible to like really hack this URL to do all sorts of filtering that you didn't intend to do. Uh, if I remember correctly, they took that out so that now you can only filter by things listed in list filter. So yay for safety, but boo for convenience. Uh, and as you can see, the URLs can get kind of gnarly. Like we have an amazing timestamp there that we're filtering by. So. Um, but these are these are really great tools. I've seen a lot of people, you know, uh, non-developers, but people working at companies that have had CMSs built in Django. That this just improves their usage exponentially because you can do a ton of work just by being able to filter this down and find something really quickly. All right, let's go to the next fun filter, which is custom filters. Because sometimes the filters that are built into Django don't do what we need. We need to write our own filters because we have some weird database that we have to you know, do some crazy query on, or we need to filter by a field we can't easily filter by, or whatever. So this one, if I remember correctly, is one of the ones that has a bit more code in it. Yeah, quite a bit more code. OK, so let's, we'll go through this slowly. In your admin file, go ahead and add a new class here that's called big order filter. You can, of course, check this one out if you want. It's tag 010. They're kind of going sequentially, if y'all hadn't noticed that yet. I was trying to think of like a good way to tag them, and I was like, I'll just use numbers, because why be creative? Uh, so uh, the simplest of filters that Django offers are the simple list filters. There's a couple other kinds that are out there as well. Um, simple list, list filter was, I do believe, the only choice for quite a while. Uh, this is the one you're going to use most of the time. Uh, the others are all in the documentation. There's tons of great examples in there for them as well. But simple list filters probably got what you're going to use most of the time. So we give it a title and a parameter name. The parameter name is what's going to be in the URL. So if you saw before, we had like and shipped at equals something like you know the, the date time string. Um, parameter name, big order, that will now be big order equals whatever. The title big order is going to be what appears on the side, where we have the filter by, uh, what is it right now? It's like filter by shipped, filter by shipped at. So title is going to be what appears over there in that bar. And then we have two methods. Uh, the first method is lookups. This is going to take the request and the model admin, which we don't need either one of those, but they're going to come in, so we might as well accept them. And we return a tuple of tuples. The first item in the tuple is the value that will go into the URL. So either the URL will get a 1 as a string or a 0 as a string. The second item in the tuple is what will appear in the filter on the uh, sidebar. So we either want it to say big order true or big order false. And then our query set method, I bet you can guess what the query set method does. This is what controls the query set. So it gets the existing query set. Like I said, these are all cumulative, so we may have had other filters done before. So it gets whatever query set we're at now. And then we're checking to see if the value that comes in is a 1. Then we're going to annotate this by a count of items. And we're going to filter where that count of items is greater than 2. So if the order has more than two things in it, it's a big order. I realize that's not actually a big order. For the data set that gets randomly generated, that's an abnormally big order. Most of them only have one item. And then finally, in the end, we, of course, return the query set. All right, so let me know when you've got the filter ready, and then I'll show you how to add it to your admin. It's way harder than you might think. It's, it's really not. Yes? Can you explain the, uh, the logic again? So if the value is 1, that's the order of one item? 
No. So, um, sorry. Yeah, let me go over that order again, or the logic again. This is either the one or the zero is going to be in the URL, right? So, like, here, let me uh, pause, pause typing for a second, everybody. Here we have this placed at. It would say big order. And then it's going to say either zero or one, right? Uh, so if it comes in as being a one, then we want to actually filter this down so it's only the big order items or the, the big order orders. Uh, naming. Uh, <laughs> so it's only going to be the big order orders. And if that's the case, then we're going to annotate the query set and then we're going to filter by that annotation. Uh, if you think you're going to be doing a lot of admin hacking and, and messing with the Django admin, get good at annotations and aggregates. Uh, they are probably the most useful tools for the Django admin for making things that are actually really handy and useful to your users. You have a question? Uh, count. count. Oh, I'm sorry. You will need to import that. From Django.db.models, import count. I kind of feel like Django should just like automatically have those on models.py and admin.py at this point because they're so useful. But then you'd be like, well, I should have them in views.py as well, and then it's just a mess. So we'll import them explicitly every time. All right, everybody have the filter set up? All right, so to add the filter, we put the name of the class in our filter list. Very, very challenging. Um, it is a little weird at first, because suddenly you have a thing that's not quoted, and yeah. Uh, now, this works the same way if you, um, like on that list display, we talked about how you could use like a, a method or a property on the, uh, on the model admin. You would, again, put it into that list without quotes, because it can look it up locally. So adding that big order filter to our list of filters, our list of list filters, gives us... whether or not it's a big order. So let's, uh, let's go back to all and any date. And let's see if I got lucky and got some big orders. I did not. I have no big orders. All my orders are small, uh, sadly. Everybody's just ordering one thing. But they're ordering like $9,000 worth of one thing, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's the great thing about random data, right? You get stuff that's fun to look at, but not realistic. So anyway. That's how we add a custom filter. <coughs> all right, so so far all we've been doing is filtering. But what about searching? I want to be able to find records that have a thing in them. I don't want to filter everything down. If I was filtering by like people's names, that becomes really annoying, right? I don't want to have to go and look up the Gs and then the As or whatever. So let's talk about searching. So we have two ways that we can do searching. What is this correct method? Oh, I think that's the one that has the models in it. When you realize you did something wrong, but Git doesn't let you change it. Um, all right, so on your customer admin, go ahead and add a new attribute that's called search fields. And the value for that's going to be a list with the string name in it. So what you're specifying in here are the fields that you want Django to allow you to do full text search on. It's not the most advanced search, but it's you know usually good enough. You got to look up somebody's name. You can type in you know Adams or whatever really quickly, and you'll find that record. All right. So once you get search fields in there, and this was customers. It's good to click on other things once in a while. Now you get a search bar at the top, right? And we can type into this, like I'm going to look for Frank. I see somebody there named Frank. And there's, there's Frank Norris, the only person I have in there who has the name Frank anywhere in their name or email address. No, just name. We didn't search admin name. So if you search Frank, Frank wins? Uh, it should. Let's search for like A-N. So yeah, so then we get Danielle and we get Brian and we get... Brian and Sandra and Natasha. Oh, for Hogan. I was like, how do we get Natasha? That doesn't have A N. It is N A. Uh, so yeah, so it's very naive search, but often that's 
all you need, right? You just need to be able to look up a name. It wouldn't do us any good if we can only search fields that we have on our model, though. So luckily, we can also search through related fields. So we're going to add this onto the purchase admin. We're going to add customer double underscore name and items double underscore name. I'm sorry, what was that? Is this follow notation? Yeah, so like how you would do filter uh, on a query set in a view, right? The exact same idea. You're just specifying it as a, a string in the admin, and then Django will do that filter for you. So it's filter, customer, double underscore name, uh, double underscore I contains equals whatever gets typed into the search field. This is effectively what it's doing. It might, be, it might be smart enough to use iSearch depending on what your database backend is, but I bet it doesn't. I bet it just says iContains, which is good enough. So what's cool about this is if you're thinking real-world scenario, if I'm looking at all the purchases that are out there, and this is how I'm handling refunds or I'm handling checking on the status of an order that somebody made, I probably want to be able to look up the customer's name while I'm looking at the orders, and I probably want to be able to look up the things that they bought while I'm looking at the orders. So this way I can now search by the customer's name, and I can search by the name of the item that they bought, and I don't have to leave the purchase page of the admin. Right? I'm on the phone talking to them, trying to look up their order to refund it. I can look it up very quickly by searching for it. So... Going back over to purchases. I should really just open these up in tabs, but I'm too lazy to do that now. Uh, so what do we have before we had N-A? No, A-N. So this gives me anybody whose name contains A-N or the item they purchased contains A-N. Uh, let's do something a little easier here. We'll do like Klein, and we get just one person. Or if we do... Uh, these people bought something that had the name lorem in it. You're going to find a lot of lorem ipsum, by the way, in the random data. So it's kind of nice being able to search on these multiple fields. And search applies across all fields. So if we had somebody whose name contained lorem, they would show up in that list as well. Yes? Is there a way to offer two separate searches? So, yes, but you're going to have to do it yourself. Um, but it's totally possible. So we will, we'll get to this towards the end of the, the tutorial. Uh, I've got a whole crazy thing to build with you all if we get to it, um, where you can go and you can, you can hack these templates. You can change these templates all you want. Uh, what's cool is you can change them per model, so you don't have to override the entire admin. Um, so you could add those search fields in and set up the views they go to and just override the query sets and you'd have exactly what you wanted. So it is possible. Django won't do it for you. All right. So now, we've looked at filtering. We've looked at searching. We've made the fields look nicer. Uh, you all know what this thing is right here? The action bar? You, you ever use that? It only comes with one by default, right? It has one action, and that action is to delete things. Okay? But lots of times you have things you need to do in the admin that apply to more than one item at a time, and you want to be able to just do them from this list view, right? Because you can't be bothered to go click on 20 things and then hit the delete button or whatever. I can't. So let's talk about adding actions. I'm going to go change my slide just because I should. I don't actually need to change the slide. <laughs> uh, so let's check out this one. This will be uh, 13, 0, 013. And you can see that we added a new action here called ship. But let's look at what that action is at the same time. So there we go. So we add one new method or function, sorry, to the class. To the class. Wow. Sorry, y'all. To the module. We had we had one new function to the module named ship. Uh, it takes the model admin, the request, and the query set. We won't need all of those, but depending on what we're doing, we might need those. So they all get to come in. Uh, you're going to see that pretty much everything you build in the admin ends up taking model admin. 
That's so that it knows which model admin it's relating to. Um, but often you don't care once it's in there. So we're going to do a query set dot update. We're going to mark anything that was included in the query set as being uh, as having shipped equal to true, and it was shipped right now. I just now shipped it. And then we're setting the short description here, which this is the text that's displayed in that dropdown. And then I add a new action to my admin in the actions list. So one of the nice things about admin, uh, like messing with the Django admin, is most of the time you're adding one attribute or you're adding something to a list. Um, there's not a lot of like random places to go for configuration. Um, but it does make it to where when we do something like this, where I'm just like, look at the things you can do with admin, there's a lot of add one line, go check out what it does in the browser. Add one line, go check out what it does in the browser. So unfortunately, a lot of back and forth. So, and again, actions could potentially create race collisions in your database because one person could fire off an action while someone else fires off an action and things could get crossed. It's less likely than the list editable. So actions are generally pretty safe to do. They're also really good for doing things that don't relate to the database. So um, maybe I'm running a conference and I have a bunch of talks in the admin and I want to notify all these speakers that they've been accepted to speak. I could, I could select all the speakers or select all the talks, have an action that says, send acceptance email, and it sends off an email to them. It doesn't actually change the database, right? It just doesn't because those are the ones I selected. Now I have to go select them again for doing the next thing I want to do, but, you know, whatever. All right, so, yes? So before you made the ship field editable? Mm-hmm. It does not, no. Yeah, you'd want to do that on the, on the model. So if you wanted to make it to where checking that checkbox and hitting save actually updated the uh, shipped at field, you'd want to override the save on your model and make it to where if shipped went from false to true before it did the save, then update shipped at. Otherwise, if it went from true to false, you'd want to like null it out. Um, you obviously probably wouldn't want to have the true to false happen, but it might. Yes. Where's time zone imported from? That is, yeah, Django.utils. Sorry about that one. It's knowing when the imports come in and when they don't, because most of the time we don't need imports, and then suddenly we have a thing that needs it. Uh, so if we look at the actions, there's now a marked purchases as shipped. So let's say that these, just because they have lorem items, all my lorem items went out. Actually, let's just do all of them. All the lorem items went out, so I'll hit go. Uh, that's fine. I apparently had an unsaved change on an editable field. And now you can see they've all been shipped, and they've all been shipped today at 9 p.m. because my time zone isn't set up correctly. But they've been shipped. So doing these, uh, the admin actions are really handy, especially if, like I said, you have things that relate to other parts of your business logic that don't necessarily relate to your database. Uh, if they relate to your database, that's cool as well, but um, being able to fire off other events is really useful from the admin. It's the thing I like being able to do, at least. All right. Dates. So if we have a lot of things that are organized by dates, which we do, right? We have shipped at as a date time, and we have uh, placed at as a date time. We probably want to be able to narrow things down based on their date. And we have the tell me it was shipped you know, within this week, but that's not necessarily as useful. I need to be able to look at all the orders that were placed in March of 2013 or whatever. So how do we do that? All right, where did we do that at? We did it here. So on the purchase admin, we're going to add an attribute called date hierarchy, which if you can spell that correctly the first time, you're better than me. 
Um, and we're going to mark that as one field. Now, these can only be marked as one field, I do believe. You can't have more than one field that date hierarchy depends on. Again, this is a thing you could hack together if you wanted um, through having multiple model admins for the same model or by having multiple um, like proxy models and then using those in the admin. But that's up to you if that's the thing you need to do. Uh, this is a thing you'll find really common for like, sorry, I'm supposed to go to the bus right now. Uh, if you're doing like blogs or publications of some sort, uh, date hierarchy is very common for that kind of stuff because you want to find all the articles that were written in you know a certain month or a certain year. So once we have that date hierarchy, let's just take that off. So now we have this uh, list of filters up here. So I can find like everything that was perhaps placed in January, and then I could go to just January 20th, and Douglas Baker and Aaron Nichols both ordered things on January 20th. So it's a nice way to be able to filter that stuff down quickly and find just the items that you want. And date hierarchy will work on anything that is a date field or a date time field, I do believe. I don't believe it works on time fields, but maybe it does, and I just don't remember. Yeah, that's, that was my thinking, is that it's just date or date time. It doesn't make a lot of sense for it to be time fields. All right, so before we go on to the detail view, any questions about list views and all those attributes we put in there? Now, there are some attributes I didn't cover. I tried to cover the ones that are the most common or the ones that had the most impact. But um, there's tons more. And the cool thing is they're almost all listed as list something. So they're really easy to look at in the docs. But any questions? Any, anything that needs cleared up for anybody? Yeah. Can you change the title for the filter? That's a good question. Um, I've got one idea on that. Let me see if I can change that. Um, so let's just call it placed. And refresh. Yeah, so if you change, uh, this is a thing a lot of people don't ever do. I know I don't ever do it. Uh, if you specify a string at the beginning here, that string is used as the verbose name for that field. So anytime you make a model form or whatever, it'll use that name. Uh, I think you can also specify label equals on the field. Um, but it'll use that name for the filter as well. So if you need to control what those look like. All right, so now, yeah. Sorry, my swiping got the best of me. Uh, let's talk about the detail view. I want to see how this one looks on the. Yeah, you can't read that white at all. That was a bad idea I made. Uh, so <laughs> the detail view is kind of the opposite of the list view. List view gives us multiple items at once. A detail view gives us a single item at once. So if we want to edit just one customer or just one product or whatever, then detail view is what we want to mess with. So let's start by talking about fields and field sets. Okay, so we can control the fields that get displayed when we're editing an, auto, uh, an item, an autumn. So let's go over here. And sorry, I gotta look for this one because I don't remember what thing I edited for this. All right, this is in products. We haven't done much in products. So I'll give you a second to make sure you have the product admin uh, set up like this. So when we specify fields, we specify a list of fields or a tuple of fields. It's your choice on which one of those containers you want to use. And inside of that, we put the string name of the fields that we want to display. This is similar to if you've made a model form and you have to specify fields inside the meta to control which fields show up in it. Exact same idea. So in this case, we want to show only the name and description of a product. which is, you know, probably not true. 
might be kind of hard to put in a product successfully with only two fields when there's like eight fields on the model. But we'll see what it looks like. Uh, and as you might guess, this isn't always the most, use, the most useful way of doing this bit. And actually, I'm not even going to show this one in the browser because it's completely silly. But we'll move on to the next one, which is much more useful. So same idea. We're just adding a little bit more onto it. If we specify more than one field inside of a tuple or a list, inside of our tuple or a list, it will put them on the same line. So now we're starting to get into this is display, right? So we're I want the name and the slug to be on the same line. I want description on a line by itself. I want price and quantity on the same line. I want serial number and location on the same line. And I want categories on a line by itself. So I'm starting to add structure to what the form looks like in the admin. So I give you all a moment to put that in. And again, this isn't always the most useful. There's, there's a better solution to this, which we'll get to in a second. Some of you are nodding. You probably already know what that better solution is. I say better. More elegant. All right, everybody caught up well enough? Let's go over here. And that was for products. And I'll go look at this one. And so now I can see I have the name on one line with slug, name and slug together. I've got description all by itself. Price and quantity are next to each other, and so on, right? So the form looks a little nicer, maybe. Things are organized a little differently. I can move things around. Maybe I declared slug way at the bottom because I didn't think I needed slugs. And then I was like, no, totally need slugs. Now I can put it up where it's more useful, things like that. All right, so like I said, there's a better way of doing this, a more elegant way of doing this. Let's check that one out. I'm not copy revision number. Checkout should be at the top. All right, so we did this one in purchase admin. Sorry to make you jump back over there. And there's what it looks like. I'll leave that up. So that's in purchase admin. We'll talk about what this is. So field sets is a typically a tuple. Most of the time, you're going to do these as tuples because less memory, and you're not worried about messing it up later. Uh, inside of that, you have as many tuple pairs as you want. Each tuple pair contains two things uh, by default. The first thing it contains is the label for that field set, or the legend, if you're talking about HTML, for the field set. And then it contains a dictionary. And inside the dictionary, you will have a key called fields, which lists the fields that are in that field set. So in this case, we have two field sets. We have one titled none, and we have one titled dates. They both have a fields attribute in the, or a fields key in the dictionary, right? Which has our a tuple of fields. And in here, since this is in its own tuple, that will be on one line. So again, I can group fields together. This classes tag, uh, tag, wow. This classes key down here controls the CSS classes that are added to that field set. And collapse is a special one that makes it collapsed. So if you're like, this is a field you might need, maybe you need to edit this, but you don't need to see it all the time. You can stick it into a field set, mark it as collapsed, and it'll be hidden away most of the time. So we'll go take a look at this in a minute when you all get through typing. And then we're not too far from break. 30 minutes. Any, uh, any questions or concerns so far with dealing with fields and field sets? What are the field set options that are available? Um, 
So what classes are available on field sets? That's a good question. If I remember correctly, there's only a couple that are built into Django for that. Um, there's collapse. There's one that makes it open by default, or not open by default. It's automatically open by default. There's collapse, and I think there's one other one that changes the display just a little bit, but I don't remember what that one is. And the Wi-Fi is spotty today. Uh, sorry about the spotty Wi-Fi, y'all. It was I remember it being pretty good last year, so maybe there's more people here this year. Uh, anyway, there's a couple of those that are available. Uh, you can also give it your own custom class name, like if you had, you know, bright pink, and then in your CSS that gets loaded, there's a bright pink class. It will get applied to that field set. So you can use this for like custom styling as well, or uh, there's a couple of packages that are out there that do like bootstrap in the admin or uh, material design in the admin. So if you were using those, they may have classes that customize how the field set looks. Uh, yeah, so bootstrap like the, the UI library that Twitter puts out, um, there are a couple of packages out there that will style the admin in bootstrap, which I guess is probably meant as a we style it in Bootstrap, and then you put your Bootstrap style on top of that. But people have been trying for years to redo the admin, and it always gets to like the point where it has to introspect and create detail view, and then people kind of give up, because that's a hard thing to do. So there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of admin customization, sadly. So that was for a purchase. So we've got the customer, we've got the total on the same line because they were marked as being on the same line. Discount code is on its own line. And then dates is hidden, it's collapsed. And I can click show to have it open. I think there's another one that does collapsed open or something like that where it's collapsible, but it's open by default. I don't remember. They're in the docs. I rarely use them, so I, I don't recall them off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, so the collapse one's really handy, especially if you have, this model isn't a great example, it only has like five or six fields, but you will occasionally have models that have 10, 20 fields, and a lot of those are, yeah, this one time we had to mark that one record that one way, right? So you don't need to edit it 99% of the time, so you might as well hide that away and not, not bother showing anybody. But the field sets, hmm, the field sets are useful no matter what though, just because you can rearrange your fields so they're in a more logical order for people to go and edit, right? They want to be able to tab through quickly and just edit things, put them in an order that makes sense for the way they'd be using it in the admin. We can go one step further, and we can write an entirely custom form if we want to. Um, unfortunately, though, none of our models lend themselves well to this bit of customization. So you can override the form that's used in your admin, and you do that by providing a new model form for your model and assigning it in the form attribute. So I have an illustrative one that I'm going to do for that because there's a, there's a whole checkout thing here for it. Um, but this isn't one that would be like realistically used. So let me find that because I don't remember where I did that. Okay. So in customer admin, I have this form equals forms.customer form. Let's collapse this down. There we go. So we need to import forms, and we need to do forms.customer form, and then I'll show you the form in a second. I'll let y'all get that part done first. Actually, can I split the window? I'm not going to bother. All right. So there's the admin. Let me know whenever you've got the admin. If anybody's still working on this part. No? OK. Let's look at the form then. So the form is pretty simple form. Uh, it literally has all the fields. I think I swapped email and name around just because I had to do something that was different from what you've seen. Um, but it's just a normal, everyday model form. And so when we combine those, of course, it will change what the form looks like in the admin. Now, you can combine all of these things together. You can do a custom form and then a field set, and they will both work you'll get your custom form with your field sets. Um, you can use custom form to override, like say, the widgets that you want to use for a particular field. 
uh, if you have like a rich text widget or an image editing widget or whatever. We will hopefully do both of those later in this thing. Um, but this is a good way to bring those in if you have them in use somewhere else. And yeah, I got to this point and I was like, none of these make sense to have custom forms. So we'll do a fake one. It's just cool to know that it's there. You don't really use it that often, or at least I haven't. All right. So what was that even? That's the customer. See, now I'm getting tired enough to do these things. And if we go look at a customer, so now we get the email address first and then the name and so on. Um, this could be a thing where maybe you wanted to split up the data so it's entered slightly differently in the admin than it's actually stored in the model. Like perhaps you wanted uh, two name fields, a first name and a last name. Even though that's not representative of names the world round, you could add that form and then resave it back into one field in your database if you wanted to or whatever. So that's like a use for it, but not, uh, not the kind of thing you're going to do every day. All right, so let's talk about save as, which also a thing I don't think I've done very often, but I can definitely see the use of this one more than I can some of the other stuff. So in your customer admin, go ahead and add these two lines, because we're going to cover two birds with one stone, or it doesn't work as well when I say cover, but anyway. So save as equals true, and save on top equals true. So save as adds a new button, which will let us save the existing record as a new record, so we can duplicate our record, okay? which is pretty handy, nice to have. And save on top, you've noticed how we've had the save buttons at the bottom, which uh, are cool, but you have to scroll all the way to the bottom. If you have a really long form, it's a long way down. Uh, this puts them on top and on bottom, so you just get them on both. So you don't have to scroll if you don't have to. I just remembered that I had offline docs so I could look up the class names. Uh, you've also, you've got collapse, wide, and extra pretty. Uh, and extra pretty has no underscores or anything in it. It's just all one word, extra pretty. Uh, I don't know what those two look like. I don't think I've ever looked at extra pretty. Uh, but wide has more horizontal space. So cool. There you go. You've got three choices by default. And if anybody wants to do extra pretty and describe to me what it looks like, I'd love to know. Or I'll test it during break. All right, so with the save stuff in there, uh, yeah, we'll edit a customer still. Uh, so we get save as new, so I can duplicate a customer. Maybe I got their record wrong or something. I just need to duplicate them for some reason. Uh, which that, uh, yeah, no, that's completely new. Uh, normally we have the save and continue editing, which lets us save and then come right back to the same record. And then, of course, our normal save. And now they're on top and on bottom, so I don't have to scroll if I don't want to. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a merge function for two records that are very similar? There is not as far as Django is concerned. But again, it is a thing you could add on your own. Uh, that would probably be better done as a list action where you'd select a couple of records and say merge. Because um, then you'd probably want to present some sort of diff view that lets you pick, like, this one has the right email address, but this one has the right physical address, right? Um, that's way beyond what uh, Django can do out of the box. Um, I know I keep talking about the random data. I love seeing ones where it's like they live in the state of Idaho in the country of Cambodia. I just, I think those are amazing. Um, all right, so. Save as, save on top, let's just move the save buttons around a little bit. I think there's a way to turn off the bottom save, but it seems silly to only have save on one side. So 
Save on top, I think, is good. Turning off the save on the bottom seems weird. All right, so we've hit the end of detail view. Any questions about detail views? I say the end. We actually aren't. We're just the end of the basic stuff about detail view, because detail view is ridiculous. But any, uh, any, yes? Uh, you know what? Let's just do it. We've got a second. Uh, I, I kind of do too, actually. So we have collapse. Let's get rid of collapse. So we've got wide. That was another one. And what is this? This is purchase admin. All right. Let's check out that purchase admin. So here we are. Collapse. Let's just do the collapse thing, right? All right. So here's wide. Wide gives us a it moved the widgets over a bit, right? Like these, these fields moved to the right a little. Cool. Very handy. I mean, actually, I can see that being useful if I did like, uh, say that, which that's a lot of commas and parentheses. But if I did that to get them on the same line, I can see wide being more useful, maybe? I don't know. Wide's kind of weird. Uh, and then I'll go back to there, because that makes more sense. And then extra pretty. All right. Any guesses on what it looks like before I refresh? Ugly. Ugly? <laughs> um, that's extra pretty. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing anything amazing. Maybe stuff got aligned a little better? It, the only place it shows up in the, in the, in the repo is in the document. It doesn't show up in the actual report. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't really exist. It doesn't exist. <laughs> maybe that's it. Yeah, maybe it's meant to be an example. It's in the docs, though, that extra pretty is a thing. <laughs> I don't know. Extra pretty, everyone. Enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy extra pretty. All right. Ooh, I feel like I'm a little loud. OK, so let's talk about customizing fields and forms more than we've been doing so far. We've been doing a ton with forms. Let's do more with forms. Because forms are everybody's favorite subject, right? OK, so we have to do a little bit of extra code before we can actually do this one. So the first thing we need to do is in our product model, which is not that one. Here we go. In our product model, we need to add a new field. So we're going to add one called, not field, uh, featured as a Boolean. No, sorry, not as a Boolean. Let me just check this one out because I'm going to mistype it, and then it's going to be horrible, and we're going to have to redo this part. Here it is. There we go. OK, so featured is an integer field. I'll scroll up to the choices in a second. Featured is an integer field, which uh, has choices, has a constant called featured. And the default is 0. So I will I'll show you those choices in a minute. I'll let you put in that field first. And then, of course, you know what we have to do when we change the model. We have to make migrations, and we have to migrate. So I will let you all do that part as well. But first, we have to look at the stuff. Can I get them both on there? I almost can. No, wait, I can. There we go. We're good. All right. So there's our choices for the featured uh, field. I'd probably do this with more constants and that kind of stuff, but that's not for now. Has anybody done choices in Django yet with Python 3.6's enum? Because I want to know if that works. I'd really want to. I really want to try that, but I haven't done that one yet. It seems like it should work but I don't know. All right, so uh, what we're basically doing is we're storing a state of the feature 
So how featured is this thing, right? It's either not featured at all, so featured is zero, uh, or it's featured everywhere on the site, or it's featured only inside of its category. So if its category is shirts, this is a featured shirt, but it doesn't show up as featured on the books page or the home page or anything like that. That's the, the logic behind this, the mentality behind it. What was going through my head as I tried to come up with a good example for this? All right, anybody need any help on doing the model migration or any of that stuff? Everybody okay with that? All right. So, now that we've added it to our model, we always need to add it to our admin, right? We need to, to do some work on it in the admin. So, don't look for a second. Let me make sure this is set like I want it to be. It's not. Oh, yeah, there's why it's not. Okay, so <laughs> we have our model, we have our migration, we've changed our database. So now we want to be able to show this in the admin, which means we need to add it to the admin. So we're going to add featured into our fields in our admin form. Uh, and so it looks like 020 was the model change and migration checkout if you're still doing the git tags. Uh, and this one should be 021. All right, so if you go and look at the model, or the, the admin, we get a drop down, right? Because we have choices. So choices automatically gives us a select box, which makes sense. We're choosing one of these things. Um, and that's fine. It's perfectly usable that way. But often you don't want to deal with a drop down. Um, they're not as appealing. They're not as easy to like visually scan quite often to see especially what your choices are. So let's change that to use radio buttons. So we're going to leave this the same. We're going to leave featured in there. But we're going to add one new attribute called radio fields. And this is a dictionary. Each key in the dictionary is the field that you want it to apply to. And the value is whether you want it to be horizontal radio buttons or vertical radio buttons. Uh, I think you can also do this similarly for check boxes if you have something that is like a many-to-many multi-select kind of thing. That's not as useful as something we'll cover in a moment, the filter horizontal, but it's possible kind of thing. Uh, but the radio fields is really useful. All right, so let's take a look at that. And before we had the drop down, and now we have radio buttons. So it takes up more room as radio fields, obviously, because there's you know more of them instead of them being in one. But it's a little bit easier to visually parse and especially to be able to see what your options are. If you have more options than will easily fit in like one line of the admin, you probably don't want to do this because then it becomes difficult to parse. That was the whole point. But if it fits in there nicely like this, it's really useful. Uh, this works very well for like state machine kind of things too. If I need to be able to, it was a draft, now it's published, or it was a draft, now it's you know in editorial, now it's in published, whatever. It's very handy for that kind of stuff because you can track the state of a thing whatever the thing is. Don't you love that part of programming where you just start referring to everything as things? All right, so I mentioned filter horizontal. Uh, these are mainly useful for many-to-minis. So uh, let's try out our many-to-mini. -many. All right, so Right now, we have categories in here on a product, right? And it's a multi-select, so if I want, right now it's in books and shirts. Uh, if I wanted it to be in, say, toys and books, I have to hold down, like, command and click the, each of the things I want it to be. This is annoying because if I accidentally click somewhere else, it can get lost occasionally. I accidentally click shirts and, oh, now I don't know what it was, okay? 
So in your product admin, we're going to add this one line, which is filter horizontal, which is a list and has the field categories in it. There is also, I do believe, a filter vertical. Yes. Filter horizontal is much more common and I think looks nicer. The filter vertical is kind of weird. All right, so if we have filter horizontal in there, it now looks like this. So these are the ones that have not been chosen, and those can be filtered down if I need them to. And these are the ones that have been chosen. So if this should no longer be in shirts, I can move it back over there. When I hit save, it's no longer in shirts. Kind of nice. So just making that UI a little bit more friendly, a little bit more uh, nice, better to use. All right, and then let's talk about pre-populated fields. This one, it's kind of weird that this is in admin because this is the kind of thing that seems amazingly niche, but it's been there forever, so they're not going to get rid of it, I don't think. And it's really useful. So in our product admin, we're going to stick in, this is the only thing that has a slug, and slug is where this is most useful. We're going to add this new attribute here called pre-populated fields. And it's a dictionary. Uh, the key in the dictionary is which field this should apply to. So we want this to apply to the slug field. And the value is a tuple of the fields that influence this field. So in this case, only name messes with it. Uh, but we might say this was a blog post. Maybe we'd have like title and date published or whatever. So does anybody not understand what the term slug is when we're talking about Django? Slug is kind of a weird term. So Django started off in a newspaper, right? It started off as the Lawrence World Journal. Journal World, I always get that wrong. And I've been there, the Lawrence Journal World. Um, so they're working on newspapers. So a newspaper will often have a, a story they're going to talk about, you know, lead in the water or birthday party or whatever. Birthday street party, which we had for Django. Uh, so birthday street party is the title of the story, but you're not going to necessarily file it under that, and you don't necessarily want to look it up as that, like on a file on a computer or a roto file or whatever. So you would slug that name to make it something smaller and easier to identify. So in Django's case, we have to make slugs, or the web's case, we have to make slugs that fit onto the web. And spaces aren't friendly on the web. Nobody wants to look at percent zero twenty, or percent percent twenty. That's it. Um, and Uppercase, lowercase is annoying, whatever. So slugs in Django are lowercase versions of a string, and instead of spaces, you have hyphens. So it's just a way for us to easily refer to a model that has a long string without using that long string, and we don't display what our primary key is in the database, because that's a potential attack vector. The less we can tell people about our database, the better. So we add pre-populated fields to slug, and this does one of my favorite things in the admin. And I don't think it's going to work on this because this is an existing product. So let's go make a new one. Add product. There's the button. All right. So PyCon 2017 store. See how it types in for me? But I realized I typed in a slug. So let's not do a slug. PyCon 2017 store. There we go. So it's all lowercase, and we get hyphens instead of spaces. Um, like I said, this is niche. I don't know of another place where pre-populated fields makes sense. It really only works for slugs. It's kind of weird that it's built into the admin. But it's Django giving you a little bit of nice JavaScript and UI stuff. Um, if you do things that use slugs a lot, this is a lifesaver. This or hide the slug field and use the slugify function to do the slugs for you. The only problem there is you can't see if the slugs overlap. I get no notification here if the slugs overlap either, but if I've typed one in before, I might see it and recognize it. I probably won't. Stick in a you know, post save that checks for slug conflicts or something. Yeah? No, it's just one way. So if I come over here and do something again.
Oh, like if I just did happy? Yeah. Since it's been set explicitly, it just leaves it. Uh, that's why I was saying I don't think it'll work on the one that I had already saved, because it won't, it won't change an existing slug, and it sees existing as any data that's in there. So it keeps it pretty, uh, pretty safe. All right, let's see. It's about 5 till 3. Let's not... Let me see what this next thing is. Yeah, let's not do this next thing. But because the break's coming up. While we're coming up on the break, since internet is somewhat horrible here, and I need y'all to install something, this is a great time for you to install something so it can be downloading while we're at break. So please go and of course I gotta check out the next thing. There we go. Please go and install these two packages, Django Image Cropping and Easy Thumbnails. So you can pip install both of those. And it's pretty much time for break. So break's probably about 15 minutes, 20, something like that. So we'll start back up at like 3.15, 3.20. I'll be loud, you'll hear me.
the sound is working. Are we good? Did I turn it on or did I turn I turned it on? We're good? All right. Yeah, I keep getting these like spikes of like I can really hear myself. <laughs> All right, that'll be fine though. Okay, so uh, we had the two requirements that came in. Um, if you installed 2.3, I'm sorry, we need 2.4.1 because 2.3 doesn't like Django's settings, if I remember correctly. Um, so just go ahead and, and just install the newest easy thumbnails. Just always stay up to date on that one. Chris, the, the guy that develops it, he's, he's good at making sure things don't break, except when they do. Uh, so once we have them installed, uh, we need to add them to our installed apps. And we do need to run Migrate because Easy Thumbnails has a couple of models that it comes with. So if you want to go ahead and migrate those, go for it. Thank you. So before we use these, I'll talk about what they do really quick. Uh, easy Thumbnails gives, as you might guess, uh, an easy way to make thumbnails. So we have an image, and we want to make a smaller version of that image. We want to make a thumbnail of it, right? Uh, so Easy Thumbnails gives us a programmatic way to do that. I can say, hey, I've got this image. Give me a size 2 thumbnail of it. And because I've set up what size 2 is, it knows how to go and make the size 2 thumbnail. Image cropping uh, is a model field and form field and form media stuff uh, to give you a nice little UI for doing a live cropping. So you can draw it like a crop box like you would in uh, Photoshop or the GIMP, and then hit save, and it will crop the image for you. So we're going to add those to the admin so we can crop images in the admin. So nice to have. So once you have those in your installed apps and you uh, migrate, there is one other setting to add. And I apologize for it not being shorter, but there's not a faster way to do this one. So we got to bring in the settings from uh, Django, from Easy Thumbnails. Uh, and then we have set up our thumbnail processors, which this controls the code that our images run through to create the uh, thumbnails. So we're adding the crop corners one, which I think that's just what handles the, uh, the live cropping box that Easy th uh, Django Django image cropping gives you. Uh, and then we're adding in all the default ones from uh, thumbnail processors, or uh, easy thumbnail. So I'll give you all a minute. Or you can check this out uh, as version, or tag 025, if you just want to do the git checkout. This is where we start getting into things that take a little bit more time to implement. We don't have to move back and forth quite as fast. All right. Anybody still working on getting these settings in? Let me know. We'll pause for a minute. All right. So now that we have it all set up, installed, now we need to add a new field to our model. So this should be in the products model. And we need to add one import here at the top. I'll let you add that instead of doing this the other way around like I've been doing mistakenly. So we'll add the import of the image ratio field. Uh, and this field just ends up in the database holding a tuple of values. Uh, I think it's four values, which is top, top and left to start, and then how 
wide and deep to go, or deep and wide, probably. Uh, so that way it knows how to do the cropping of the image. And then once you have the import in, we're going to add this one field to our image model, which is called cropping. Um, the first thing we specify in this is which field holds the image that we're going to crop. And the second thing is what the default cropping dimensions should be. So we're going to make a 300 by 500 image by default. I'm not going to go into all the stuff Django image cropping does. Uh, the documentation is really good for that one. So if you end up using it in your products, go check it out because it's pretty handy and pretty cool. It's a nice, nice thing to have. All right, everybody good on that field? This will require a migration, so go ahead and do make migrations and migrate because we have to store this data in the database so we can reliably crop that image. And what's funny is I'm actually not going to even do the part in the template that shows the cropped image because we're not looking at templates today. We're just, just in the admin. But you'll get to see the cropping widget and all that stuff. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and check out the next thing, and then once you all have your migrations done, we'll go check that out. All right, so now we need to use it in the admin. So in our products admin.py, where's our image admin? So first we do an import, which is from image cropping, import image cropping mixin. It's very nice when people provide the admin stuff for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. Thank you, people who developed Django image cropping. I don't even know who that was. Who was that? Jonas Underwolf. Thanks, Jonas. That's also an amazing name. Uh, so once you have that mixin uh, imported, then we're going to register the image if you haven't already registered that in your admin. Uh, and we're going to add the image cropping mixin into the registration. We're going to do a pass because we don't need to do anyth anything special, anything extra for the, uh, for the model. We're just going to register it, show it in the admin. But by using that mixin, it lets us do a bunch of work that we don't have to do. I will show you that work in a moment. First, let's go see what this looks like. So everybody got that in? We're good. All right, uh, that was for an image. Images belong to products. So I have one image that I've saved. You may not have any images that you've saved. Uh, feel free to create a new image and add it to a, a product. So here's an image of uh, a, a lovely monitor. And you can see there's a box on here that I can resize to change how the image crops. So if I cropped it like that and I hit save, uh, I could then in my templates use the template tag to render the cropped image and it would show just the part that's inside that rectangle. It wouldn't show the entire image. So let's look at how it does this. Because we didn't do anything there, right? We just added in that mix in. So let's look at what um, one of these three people here did. Uh, to make this work. So this is the mix-in that we brought in. So remember we added the image cropping mix-in. So he's over, they are overwriting this form field for DB field. So what that uh, method does is it says, okay, I have a database field here that is something, whatever that is, what form field should I use? So this is how to figure out the form field for a database field. So we talked before about having the fields in the list editable that's what Django's doing behind the scenes. It's going, OK, you've got this kind of field. How do I show it? So it's looking for anything that's marked as being uh, in the crop fields. Uh, if it can find that, and if not, it gives us a, a blank dictionary. And then if there's a DB name that's in there, then it uses that. And it sets the widget. Um, does it set the widget? Oh, OK. So git backend calls git widget, and git widget returns the widget to you. So in this case, it's showing an image and putting the crop box on it, and including like the JavaScript and things like that that it needs to render all of that and make it work. 
this is not code you want to have to write. This is not code you're often going to have to write, but I wanted to kind of show you some behind the scenes stuff, how this can be manipulated. You can go way further than this if you need to. We'll do some stuff like this on our own in a bit. All right, so any questions? No? All right. You notice that the color is getting a little darker. It's because we're getting into things that are a little iffier to play with. All right, so let's talk about inlines. Inlines will let us edit multiple records on the same page. So when we're on a detail view, we're editing one record, right? But often we have related records. If we look at a product, a product has multiple images, right? Or at least it has one image, which is also stored in the database. I want to be able to edit a product and edit the image for that product at the same time. Or maybe I want to be able to add images to products because I haven't added any yet. So how do I do that? I should have had this slide up while I said that. So let's talk about the stacked inline. So we have uh, two different choices for what our inlines look like. We're going to be doing this on products. So I'm going to stay here on the products admin. And let's bring that in. So we're going to add this right here. So go ahead and add that in. So it's of class image inline. We're using that image cropping mix in again. And I'm marking this as an admin.stacked inline. There are two types of inline. The first one is called stacked. The second one's called tabular. We'll look at each of them. We'll look at stacked first. And we specify what model this inline relates to. So this inline relates to the image model. Oh, look at that. I can get it on the same page. And then once you have your inline created, add it to your inline's attribute <coughs> on your product admin uh, Model admin. So this is a, a list where you can specify as many inlines as you want for that model. All the inlines, the model on the other side of the inline, has to have a foreign key back to the model that you're editing. So our image model has a foreign key to product, because one product can have multiple images. So that way I can make an inline for it. If it was the other way around, I can't put that in. So I can't go to the image and edit the product, but I can go to the product and edit the image. And on many to minis, I don't remember if you can do throughs or I guess you could do the through as a inline, but that's often weird. So we won't worry about that. All right, so everybody have their inline ready? Let's take a look at that. Uh, let's see, we were on a product. So here we go. We're going to add a product. You can do this on a product that exists, too. And you notice now we have three extra fields inside of here. These are our inlines. Each one of these will let us add an image to the thing. Let me go and that was that first one. OK, let me go back to the saved ones so I can show you what this looks like with an image already in there. All right, so there's our normal form. And when we get down here, here's the image, and we still have our crop box because we're using that mix-in. So what's cool is all that stuff we've been setting, the not necessarily the list stuff, but all the stuff about the form that we've been controlling, right? The form fields, the field sets, the collapsing thing, all that kind of stuff can be applied to inlines almost universally. I think there's a few that don't work there. The list ones don't make sense because you're not displaying a list. But all the ones that we've been doing for detail view, pretty much every one of those works for inlines as well. So if you've got a model that you've made the admin look really awesome and you really like the way it works, and then you're like, oh, I need this as an inline, you can basically just copy it right over. So that's kind of kind of a nice little feature. Or you make that like a mix in, you know, an object and then just include that, because who wants to type it twice if you don't have to? All right. So that's a, ta a stacked inline. Our next option is a tabular inline. So let's, this is on our purchase one. So this will be in our customer's admin. And let me go ahead and check that out. All right, so we've made a new inline here called the purchase item inline. 
And this one, notice, is a tabular inline. So stacked, if you look at the form on it, the fields are stacked on top of each other. So each line has a, a field on it, right? For tabular, they're done horizontally, like a table. That's all I got. It seems like they could have done inline and then like horizontal equals true, but that's not what they did. So it probably renders different templates. So once you have the purchase item inline, let me find where we're putting that. I'm pretty sure that's on the purchase. Purchase admin, yeah. Purchase admin, we're doing an inline and the purchase item inline. So this way we'll be able to look at the purchase and then look at all the items that were purchased in that purchase. So if we need to go and edit somebody's purchases, check out how many things they purchased, whatever, ship part of the order, then we can do that. Everybody good on that inline? Let's go check that one out. Okay, so here's a purchase with our extra pretty thing there. And then here's our purchase inlines, and these are tabular, so they're horizontal. All right, so here's our product that they bought, here's the quantity they bought, and then we can delete the fact that they bought it. So this actually is a mini-to-mini. -mini. Um, yeah, this is a mini-to-mini. -mini. So this is showing the, here's the product that they bought, how many they bought, and we can delete the fact that they bought one, or we can add like, they also bought three of that thing. And so now those are both in there, and they're both records for that order. So now if I was to go back and do my uh, big order filter, this, item would, this, fil this order would now show up. So yay, now we have a big order. A whole two items. They bought so much. All right, so any, any questions about inlines? So yeah. Um, to delay the loading? No. Um, your best bet on improving if there was a ton of items related uh, is, I don't know if there's a way, there might be a way to paginate it. I'm not certain if there is. Um, or you could go into some of the methods that are involved in rendering the inlines and, or loading the query set and do like prefetch related or select related on that to move the load to the database versus uh, the rendering of the view. If you're commonly encountering like 10,000 items related to something else, that might be a sign to change how you're manipulating the data or storing it as well maybe. I don't, I don't I've not dealt with something quite that size in the admin, so I can't say for certain. Um, there have to be ways around it, though. I just don't know what they are. Um, so inlines are actually a thing that comes in the front end of Django, the non-admin part of Django as well. You can do form sets and inline form sets. They are a whole lot harder to do there than they are what we just did in admin. Uh, admin very nicely takes care of a lot of the overhead for that for you. Um, generally, I say if you're going to use inlines, only use them in the admin. The front end, it's perfectly possible to use them. They work great. You just have to be careful setting them up. So just a little caveat there. Uh, yeah, so like I said, you can customize all the inline stuff too. And you had a question about them. Anybody else questions about admin inlines? You get two choices, stacked or tabular. Usually stacked looks better, but if your model is short, tabular is nice. No? All right, cool. Now we're into the red stuff. So templates and media. Do any of you really love doing HTML and CSS and JavaScript? Not a single hand. Wow. All right, well, we're going to do some. So <laughs> get, get ready to do them. All right. So what's cool about the admin is um, we've been looking at all these pages, right? So we've got like the, the index where all the apps are listed and all the registered models, and we've had like the list page with all the model instances on it, and we've had the detail page where we're editing the details of a single model. So all of those have their own templates. And Django's template engine is, template engine is one of my favorite parts of Django because it's so well designed. 
with how the admin is set up, you can override those templates globally. So if I want to change the way that every list view looks, I can do that. I can specify a list view template and they will all look like that. Or I can do that for a single app. Or I can do that for a single model, which is really nice because then I can get things just, I can build things exactly like I want them to. I have this one model that needs this special template. I can do that and it's not going to affect any other model anywhere in my app, which is really cool. Uh, is it just done through, it's just done through the file system location, yes. So yeah, you, you, you control how nested and ordered your templates are, which will determine where that template applies. We'll, we'll do some of it, so you'll, you'll get to see. So um, I have a fun, let's see how this internet is. Give it a second. All right. So this is effectively a list of the templates you can override. Look at all those templates. There's a bunch of them. Now, you won't override all of these. You won't even override most of these most of the time. I'll point out a couple, and then we'll go override a couple ourselves. So base.html and base site.html, those are probably the two you're going to override the most, because those are the ones that you're like, oh, we need our company's branding on this before we give it to the client, right? Or we need to white label this, so we need a template where we can just stick in whatever the customer's name is every time, right? Those are the places where you're going to do that most of the time. Change form and change list, you can probably guess what those control. Those control the form page and the list page. So those are two that are pretty common to override. Um, and then, I mean, that's most of it. What else is pretty common? Um, you might end up overriding like login and like the logout pages, stuff like that, the auth pages, because you want to control what the login, logout process looks like, right? You want to use your own styles, your own templates, or uh, logos, whatever on those. All right, so let's override a couple of templates. I have two of these. Oh, I just didn't change the name. See how great I am at Git? I don't even change the commit message. All right, so let's pull up base site. Okay, so this is at, uh, there's a global templates directory out next to manage.py. Uh, inside that should be a folder called admin, or you'll make a folder called admin, and inside that you'll make a file called base.html. This is one place that if y'all don't want to type along, because often HTML is very verbose and a lot of typing, feel free to just watch, check out the Git repo, um, simply because there's a lot of HTML, and HTML is not the most fun thing to try to type in a class, uh, especially a time-boxed class. So. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm extending, basically I, it, you, you copy a lot of what's in the template that Django gives you, right? But what I did, I did one amazing thing. It's so amazing. Here where it normally says like Django admin or site name, something like that, I changed it so it says PyCon store. It's just, it's groundbreaking. Um, but so now, instead of Django admi administration, it says PyCon store, because we're at PyCon and it's the PyCon store. So everything else is left alone. We just changed one little thing. You might be amazed, you might not be, at how often clients want exactly that one change. You make that one change, suddenly they are super happy because it doesn't say Django administration. It says, you know, widgets are us. And now their thing looks like it's their thing. And it's pretty cool. OK, so that's a simple one. Let's do one that's slightly more complicated. And let's pull out 031. And what was that? Products, templates, products, change form. All right, so you know how I said that we can do this per app, per model kind of thing. So right up here, that may be, can I, can I zoom in? No. Okay, so uh, in the products app, in the templates directory for the products app, there's an admin directory. Inside of that, there is a products directory. And inside of that, there is a product directory. So admin's the thing we want to override, products is our app, product is our model, and then changeform.html changes, or is, the, is the page that's played for the change form. So again, this change is not amazing. I do want to show you one 
neat thing about this, though, that you may not have caught. And I actually tried it and then was like, oh, wow, it works. So I stuck in this Enjoy Our New WYSIWYG Editor, which we don't have one yet. We'll get to that in a second. But if you look at the template, I'm extending admin change form. So I'm telling it to just extend the existing version that Django provides. Um, you can do this even when you have like a name. Like if you are overriding admin change form.html, you can still do this, and Django will go find the Django one, and you don't have to retype all of that stuff yourself. Now, Django's admin templates would not be hurt by adding a few hundred more blocks into them that you can override to stick things in in specific locations, um, but they're not terrible. You will often find yourself having to copy and paste just to get a little bit of code, a little bit of text in right where you want it. Um, might be a good pull request for somebody who wants to contribute to Django to go add you know, like pre and post content blocks, if nothing else. That would be really handy. Um, but you don't have to. So anyway, uh, what we're doing here is we, we read the block content, we stick in an h1, and then we call block.super, which that just brings in everything that the block already had in it. Okay, So pretty simple template. All right, so let's get to the fun part. Let's do a WYSIWYG. Because everybody wants a WYSIWYG editor, right? What you see is what you get. Uh, OK, so if you want to follow along, and the internet is horrible, which occasionally it is, First of all, let me show you where to go if, you, if the internet isn't terrible. Uh, so this is called Trumbo WYG. I promise it has nothing to do with the president. Um, it's by Alex D on GitHub. So this is pretty cool. It gives us this little WYSIWYG editor, so we can Make lists, make things bold, whatever we want to do, right? So pretty simple WYSIWYG. Uh, if you want to download this, go right ahead. There's a download button like right there. We'll need to move files in. It's also in the Git repo if you just want to switch to the tag. It is tag 032. Um, so you'll do git checkout 032. So this is what we're going to use. So let me go ahead and get that checked out. And I'm actually going to move on to the next one. Uh, I do suggest checking this out, or uh, I have them on zip files as well if anybody really wants them, because you end up with this file here, or this directory here that has like 600 files in it, I want to say, because it has language translations and stuff. Um, so it's not the most fun thing to, uh, to download and, and place. But the most important parts that are in here are we have a... Uh, CSS file, a minified CSS file, and we have a minified JavaScript file. We need those two things. And uh, Django's admin provides jQuery for us. So if you're using jQuery in your plugins or in, your, in the code that you write, jQuery is already provided for you. It's namespaced as django.jQuery. That will not work for plugins like this because they expect dollar sign. There's ways to rebind it, but those are hit and miss. So I don't recommend doing them. So we're going to make a new widget. New widget. This is where I said we were going to get into some of the slightly nastier stuff. See how many files I changed? All right, so let's go through these one at a time. So first of all, we have a bit of JavaScript. So this is stored in products slash static slash products. Um, and I just called this product admin.js. So it doesn't do anything super special. Um, we grab the description uh, form field. We call trumbo wyg on another field call, or another ID called WYSIWYG, which we haven't added yet. We'll do that in a moment. When it's initialized, we hide the description field. And whenever what's in the WYSIWYG thing changes, we want to update the uh, description field's contents. We want to stick whatever HTML goes into the WYSIWYG thing into the field we're going to store in the database. Okay? So we're just holding on to state, effectively. In admin products, products, you all remember this thing, where we said to enjoy your new WYSIWYG editor. Um, we brought in the admin URLs and i18n, like we should have done before, uh, and admin modify as well. So those are tags needed for rendering different bits and pieces of the admin. 
Um, a lot of Django's admin, unfortunately, is tucked away inside of template tags. So if you're looking through the admin code and you're like, I don't see where they're rendering the list items, it's in a template tag. So go look through template tags. Uh, but we needed static, because we needed to be able to load the Trumbo YG uh, JavaScript, and we needed to be able to load our own JavaScript that we wrote. Right, the, the one that I showed you a while ago that's just holding on to the state. Okay. And then, oops, let's not talk about that one yet. Let's talk about this one. So then in my products app in the templates directory, I have a new directory called widgets. And inside that, there's a file called wysiwyg.html. So I'm putting this into widgets. Widgets are what we call the form fields that are actually rendered in a form. So the little field that's there is called a widget. I don't know why they call it a widget, but they do. So it's a text area. That's what we're going to be overriding as a text area. So I want to include the text area that would normally be there. I don't want to destroy what Django would normally do. I want Django's work to still be there, especially if somehow or for some reason somebody was using my admin and they didn't have JavaScript. I still want to show the form like normal so it will work. Right? Don't want to cut anybody out. If that widget has a value that's already stored, I want to render that value, and I'm marking this as being safe HTML. Otherwise, Django would escape all the HTML, and we would see the angle brackets instead of it actually being like a bold tag. And then we include the text area. We probably don't need that twice. All right. Anyway, it's there twice. Fun. Uh, but we don't need it there twice. All right. So all we did was we, we, made, a new, we made a new widget to be displayed. Okay, and we also, this is where we brought in the ID of WYSIWYG, and we've wrapped the whole thing in this div. All right. Now let's just go look at admin. That would have been products admin. All right. So then, in products admin, first of all, I'll come up here. I imported Django's models as DJ models because I didn't want naming conflicts. And DJ models is kind of fun to say. Um, and then we do a form field override. So this is where we say, hey, you've got this field. I want you to override it with something else. So I've said anything that's listed on this model as being a text field, which is the, the large text area. For the widget, use this WYSIWYG text area widget, which that's a thing I also created. You'll see how much fun it is to make custom widgets. It's like three lines of code, and you're done. So in, to make the widget, uh, we import text area, because I want this to work as a normal text area. I call it WYSIWYG text area, because I'm creative in naming. And I specify that the template is going to be that WYSIWYG.html that we created. All right? So things are more or less just filling in little bits and pieces. I need to make a new widget. Then I need to make the template that widget renders. I need to tell the form to use that widget instead of the one that was already there. And I need some JavaScript because it's going to do cool JavaScript things. OK. I think it works now. Let me check. That was product, right? I don't remember if I had another step I had to do or not. I didn't. Look at that. So we have our, uh, we have our field. We can make that say bold. Let's make it uh, italic as well, because that's cool. And let's save and continue editing. And it is still bold and italic. So we get a WYSIWYG editor in our admin. Uh, you'll notice the styling's a little weird, like we get like this overlap on the gray and stuff. These are things you'd want to go and tweak after you put it in. You'd change CSS around a little bit to make sure it looked like the Django admin. Since this wasn't created to work with the Django admin, it doesn't necessarily look perfect in the Django admin but all things that can be fixed through the powers of CSS, which everyone is very comfortable and powerful at, right? None of us ever have any issues with CSS? Just me? OK. Yes? Mm -hmm. A text area. Yes. So if I'm overriding this on text areas, but if I have more than one text area, how do I handle that? 
that's probably where you'd go into uh, creating a custom form. So we talked earlier about how you can make a custom form class and then use that in your admin. So if you do that, then on whichever field you want, you can specify what the widget is for that field. So that's probably your best, um, your best bet for doing that. If you get more clever with like CSS and stuff, you could do it other ways through IDs, but it's probably easiest to just override that form and say, hey, make this field this widget. Um, I don't think I need to do that thing that I have on my slide there. Let's find out. <laughs> hmm, yeah, okay. So that's all I have to do there. So let me double check something. Hold on just a moment, y'all. Oh yeah, that was the thing I had to do. Ah, okay, so uh, in your um, admin classes, I, I don't know if any of you have done this or not, inside your form classes, when you're doing a model form or a regular form, you can provide a class media, and then you can specify the CSS and JavaScript that belongs to that form as special media, right? I need to bring in this JavaScript or the CSS, and I wanna use those. You can do the exact same thing in your admin because it's just rendering a form. So Django's like, yeah, it's a form, Give me the form stuff. So in this case, I say for all device types, use this trumbowig.min.css, and for JavaScript, include jQuery off of the jQuery website. Like I said, you get jQuery in the admin, but it's namespace, so it makes plugins not work. It kind of seems like they should just cut it out, but whatever. Or give me a setting to namespace it or not namespace it. That would be nice, too. All right, so let's see. It is 4 o'clock. We have until 4.40. Y'all want to do something crazier? Crazier, I say. See, normally at this point I'd say questions. Are there any questions? No? Y'all have been good about asking them as we go. And then normally I'd say thanks, but we've got time left. So let's do a dashboard. See? Tricky. All right, so... Um, this is not the most full-featured dashboard you will ever encounter, because I had to do something that I knew would just fill time. But it's the start of a dashboard. It's an amazing pink. This is going to be fun. All right. So what I want to do is I want to have um, all my purchase items. I want to be able to see how much people are spending on the site, like in aggregate. All right? Things that are being sold, all that kind of stuff. So let's do that. The first thing we're going to do and y'all can start playing along again if you want, is, I don't think that's the first thing I need to do. Sorry, just trying to figure out what, again, I didn't name things differently for some reason. All right, so let's go to product models, and, oh, customer models. And at the bottom, I made a new model that's called Purchase Summary. And it extends Purchase, but it is a proxy model. It being a proxy model means it will not make a new database table. We don't need to do any migrations or anything like that for this. This just gives us another name that we can reference for doing stuff with. And we're doing this mainly because, you remember how we can override templates down to a very specific model? We want to be able to override templates to a specific model to give us a dashboard for that model instead of a dashboard for all products. And then the verbose name and verbose name plural control how things will show up in the admin. And while we're doing this, there's actually something else we should change because some of you may have been bugging. It's been bugging me. Has anybody noticed it? Does it start with a C? <laughs> and end with a Y when it shouldn't? Uh-huh. We'll fix that, too. I was just leaving to see if it bothered anybody enough to bring it up. It didn't, but I could see a couple of you noticing it. Uh, this is 035. Zero, 035. Oh, it looks like I have a mistake in this one now. So that's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So let's actually look at this one. Oh yeah, I did do it wrong. 
sorry, it should be extending purchase item, not purchase. That's the annoying thing about git tags is they're really hard to rearrange, especially once you started pushing things. I can force them, but then potentially it breaks stuff for y'all. I don't want to do that. So we'll extend purchase item instead. And then, like I said, we'll fix the products models in a moment too. So it doesn't say categories with a YS. Whoa. What died? It should be in the class branch. Looks like I have a mistake. Let me try and debug this live. I have to close a bunch of this stuff here. All right. Here it's for purchase item. Oh, that should be purchase placed at. Huh, okay. All right. So, yeah, so this thing here says categories with a YS. We can fix that real quick. Verbose name plural equals categories. There we go. Now it's not offensive anymore because the YS is terrible. Okay, so um, we have in models, we have this model, the purchase summary model, purchase item is what it extends, class meta, proxy equals true, has a verbose name, a verbose name plural. So verbose name is just when I talk about this thing in a formal setting, what do you want me to call it? So put a space in there. Uh, and how should I pluralize that formal name, IES, because we don't do YS, right? We'd never do that. We would never have that. Okay. So... We're going to need a template for this in our admin. And we can go ahead and register it in the admin um, with like purchase summary admin for the model purchase summary. You know, this, this thing we've been doing for registering all of our models. Uh, and you can do a date hierarchy if you want to be able to filter down to products that were just ordered in the you know, last year or the last month or whatever. That's fine as well. But we should do, what, what we want to do is we want to be able to look at all of these purchases and then we want like some sort of summary data about this. We want to, we want a way of seeing this in a more useful format. So, if I'm checked out up there, I should still have the templates. I'm going to hop back which is probably going to break something, but y'all will be good because you've seen the good code, so we're okay. All right, so let's check this out. I haven't ever clicked the smart checkout button. Let's see what it does. Oh, of course it creates a merge conflict. I love how Git doesn't know how to handle blank lines. Oh my goodness, there's blank lines. What do we do? Okay, so we have a new template, which is products, templates, admin. That's not right. Sorry, let me find the template real quick. That's it. Okay. So templates, admin, customers, purchase summary, change list. 
because that's the one that we want to affect, only that model, only the purchase summary model, and only the change list page. There is a lot of HTML here, so great. Uh, this is fine. When we come over here to our thing, which is now broken. Why is it broken? Because it changed. I promise it's OK, Django. Oh. OK, don't do what I'm about to do. This is just to make it work for this moment. So I can show you what this form looks like, <laughs> or what the symbol looks like. All right. This would be customers. Purchase summaries, right? That was the thing we created. There's our list of purchase summaries, because there's nothing inside that results list. So let's close a couple of tabs here, too. We don't need all of these things open. All right, so in this template that I changed, in this change list, I cleared out the block result list. Result list is what appears in here, where all of the results would be, that big list of items. That's the result list. That's where all that stuff would show up. So all I did was get rid of all that. Okay. So we're scoped to just that one model. I really wish when I changed the slide here, it just immediately went to that page or that, that thing. Register with the admin. We've already done that. We're good. OK, so we need the humanized filters. We want to be able to put in commas and stuff where they belong. So we're going to add a new app to our settings. Let's just do it. All right, so up here in your installed apps, which is somewhere up here. There it is. Add in django.contrib.humanize. Uh, if you've not played with humanize, humanize is nice. It gives us uh, template filters for adding in commas or using natural days or time since kind of things. So you can say it was a month ago instead of, you know, April 24th or whatever, which I realize is less than a month, but it'll be fine. All right. Uh, there's no migrations needed for humanize. You just use it like it is. Now let's get into the internals of a admin. So that should be customer's admin, right? Close the purchase admin. It's a lot of code. We'll walk through it. And again, don't feel like you have to type all this. You can watch the video later, check out the repo all that kind of stuff. So we have our purchase summary admin, the one that we've been working on for the whole past 10 minutes. Um, and what we're doing now is we're going to override just this change list view. So change list view is the method that's run whenever this change list page is called up. Okay? So when you say, I want the change list page, Django says, OK, cool. Go to your model admin, run change list view, and I will render whatever comes back whatever the response is from that, OK? So we call super to get the change list view that would have been there anyway, because we want that. And we sort that into response. And then we try to pull the query set out of that. And if for some reason there wasn't a query set, there, there really should be a query set. There should be some records here somewhere, or at least a model. Um, if there's not, we'll just return the response right away, because somebody's doing something else, and we don't want to mess with it. But ideally, we get our query set. So then I'm going to make a dictionary here called metrics. I want one item called total, and that's going to be the sum of the quantity. So how many of these items were ordered in total? And then total sales, what is the total combined price of all of these sales, the total combined money made by all these sales? And into response context data, I'm going to add a new key called summary, and it's going to be a list of all these uh, things. We're going to grab the product name. We're going to annotate each of those items with the metrics, and we're ordering it by quantity, excuse me, in reverse order, so we get the largest quantity at the top. Then we add another key to that context data dictionary, which is a, a new dictionary that is the aggregate of the entire query set with those metrics applied. So is anybody fuzzy at all on annotations and aggregates for the admin? 
Yeah, a couple of nods. All right. So they're, they're a pretty simple idea, but they're a thing that not a lot of people play with, and they're really weird the first time you look at them. So an annotation is new data that's attached to each record. Okay? So if I wanted... Um, I'm storing jobs in the database, and I know when the job started and I know when the job ended. And I want to know the total duration of that job. I could create an annotation that uses the database values to figure out what the duration was and attach a new field to a new field. It's not a real field, it's attached afterwards. It's never in the database. To the record that says, oh, the duration was 15 seconds or two hours or 15 days or whatever, right? Aggregates apply to the entire query set. So if I want to know with all of these orders, what's the total price for all of these orders, then the aggregate can do that. It can add up all the prices for all of those records. So aggregates are individual records, or individual bits of data about multiple records, and annotations are new bits of data about an individual record. They may be applied to a lot of them because you have a lot of things in your query set. Okay, so we're adding two new metrics to each item from our database. And we're adding a dictionary with two new metrics about everything in the database, or everything that we selected in the query set. Right? Yes? So can you just the for, um, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So the sum here is called when annotate and when aggregate is done, because they're done over two separate data sets, right? Annotate is done per row, so we're calling sum per row, and then aggregate is calling sum for the entire query set. So we're calling sum twice, but that's fine because we're summing two different things. Django.db.models. It's from the same place that we imported count from. We also import sum. Uh, there's others in there as well. There's like average, mean, I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of them, right? So it, it's your typical money-focused, data science-y things that you're going to want to do. Money, money slash numbers. So uh, they're, they're really handy. You can get standard deviation and stuff like that. Uh, they're, they're very handy. Uh, and what's cool is this sets us up for being able to do like a chart. I'm not going to do a chart because I don't want to bring in yet more like JavaScript or CSS, but if you wanted to do charts or graphs, this is a great place to start doing that because now you've got that data. Instead, we're going to do a new template. And I am definitely not going to type all of this one. Not that I've been typing most of this stuff already, but this is a lot of code. So here's our change list. Um, so we're bringing in humanize up at the top, just like we uh, said we would need to. And then we're making a new table here called results. Now we're giving it this class of results because that's what Django styles automatically. You want this to look like Django, so you use Django's classes. Right? Uh, we have a table where we have product, quantity, and total sales. We loop through each of those and print out what the product was, what the quantity was, what the total sales was. We're using int comma here to put in a comma for thousands, hundred, you know, millions, and so on. Uh, if you were using a Localization that used, like, say, spaces instead. That's what you would get. You'd get spaces instead of commas. Humanize is smart enough to do that. And then we add a new row at the bottom that's got, like, a bold line at the top that is going to print out our total from our summary total and our total sales from our summary total. So let's see what our completely random and made-up data gives us for that. So this uh, Ericum Vitae sold 99 and made $318 in total sales. Uh, the Fugiot is ob obviously a better product to sell there. Uh, and when we get to the bottom, because we sold a lot of products, we get our total here. We've sold 10,144 products total, and we've made almost $100,000 on it. So nice, we get a little dashboard. This is where, again, you'd probably want to put in like a graph, because maybe you'd want to do this like for a month's worth of stuff. How would I, like, what would I have, right? And in fact, if we go over here, that was customers, right? Yeah. All right. And if we put in date hierarchy, and that would be purchase, click 
replaced at, right? I think that was the field. All right, let's see how we did in February. So February, we sold $16,000 worth of stuff. Um, what about on February 8th? That one day, one thing. Okay, that's not as great of a day as I had hoped. Uh, Valentine's Day, how did we do there? A lot of late Valentine's Day presents. So it's kind of nice being able to just see those for just the date that you want to deal with or the time period. You could do more filters on this as well. You could add in filters where show me only the big orders, show me only the things that have been shipped, show me only the things that have been placed within the last month or whatever. Um, and since you're only modifying the query set that comes in, which comes in through all those filters, you're only going to show the details for those items. All right. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe it is for everything. Let's find out. We'll go to page three. Yeah, this pagination, um, I think that's just a holdover from the original thing that we put in. But because we've changed the query set, it's not actually applying the pagination anymore. Um, so yeah, we've lost that. Yes. Yeah, um, we can do the add purchase summary. There's nothing to click now to go and see what the purchase summary would be. Um, let's see. Yeah, it, it's, it's meant to be basically a read-only thing. I think if you were to do product there, let's see if we can make this slightly more useful. I'm probably going to get told I can't. No. What about product name? Where's a product name which is not defined in list display? All right, I'm not going to mess with that right now. Um, you could eventually get it to where it showed the things you wanted, and you could click to go and see what the order was and all that kind of stuff. Um, it'd probably make more sense to have like showing the list, uh, the say the order number. Because if this was a real store, you would have like purchase order numbers or, you know, purchase numbers. And then that would be the one you'd want to click and go to. So, yeah. So, I don't have a slide here that says questions, but this would be where I'd ask for questions. Otherwise, we'll go back this way. And I will say thank you for attending. We've got, we're a couple minutes under the normal time, but... It's all right. Now you can hit bag stuffing if you want to. I think it's still going on. It's not to be missed. It's amazing. Uh, if you think of a question tomorrow or the next day or whatever, hit me up on Twitter or email me. I will probably not answer tomorrow because, you know, PyCon. But <laughs> later on, I will answer <laughs> gladly. Uh, and I did want to say, wow, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Uh, I'll leave that up for a minute, just so people feel like they got thanked for providing the free things that I showed you. Uh, especially the Hockey Bonita, which I probably butchered that name. They have an amazing tutorial um, showing how to do that dashboard admin and more. They do graphs and stuff, too, at the bottom of it. Um, go check that one out if you want to, uh, to play with that more. So I shamelessly ripped off the first like half of that to do my table there. So I guess I have shame. I'm telling people I did it. But Anyway, thank you, uh, and be sure to fill out the uh, survey that PyCon put out. Every year they want the surveys. <laughs>